Welcome back to another exciting episode of Behind the Burner. I'm Chef Zach, and I have with me our co-host, Chef Randy. Today, we have a distinguished guest in our virtual kitchen. Joining us is Chef Henry, a chef who has been through the trenches. He is here to tell us about his culinary adventures. Welcome, Chef. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. It's a pleasure being here. Absolutely. So, you... uh got some great stories and some interesting ideas about the industry and i'm really excited and chef randy's also really excited so why don't you go ahead and share with us a little bit of backstory and uh just go ahead and share all right yeah uh i'm originally from greensburg pennsylvania it's about 15 minutes east of pittsburgh i grew up there my whole life i grew up in a italian family my grandmother was 100 percent italian her father came from italy came from Naples. So I have a very good appreciation of food and food culture. Um, When I was back there, I got into a lot of trouble. I got really into drugs. Uh, So then I ended up, you know, things you do when you do drugs. I did crimes, ended up in prison for uh, five years. Um, I know know it, it sounds stupid, but it was probably the best thing that could ever happen to me. I was on a path that was no good. I would be dead. Like, out of my eight best friends growing up, six of them are dead from heroin overdose. So the prison might have messed around and saved my life. Um, So you always got to think positive about things like that. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I did that time. And so what I found out was I never knew I had a sister. So my mom got pregnant at a really early age, and she gave the kid up for adoption. Never knew about it. And I'm sitting in prison and my mom writes me a letter and says, you have a sister and she wants to write you. I'm like, what? Well, turns out uh, my sister couldn't get pregnant and she was trying to look for family records. So she contacted her birth mother and my mom was like, you have a brother in prison. You should write him. So me and her, we wrote every week. We got really close. And when I was getting close to getting out, she said, you should move out here with me. At first, you know, I'm from the city. Uh, And she's like, you move out to meet Idaho. And the only thing you ever hear about Idaho is one thing, potatoes. You don't hear nothing else. So I was just like, I don't know. But she convinced me. She sent me pictures of the mountains, convinced me to come. So I came out there. um, And it just so happens that her best friend, little sister, and me started dating. And now she's actually my wife. So my wife has actually known my sister her whole life, which is pretty cool. Crazy. Yeah. Such a small world. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and then uh, so I came out west. I came to Idaho, and I was just looking for any job I could get. Um, and so I went and washed dishes um, at Yard House, basically. And uh, when I was younger, I went and had a part-time job at a pizza place for this Italian guy. His name is Bimbo. And he taught me how to hand-toss pizzas. And he was pretty busy. He had a big window in the front. And to draw people in, he would always put me in the window and make me hand toss pizza. Like I learned tricks, like I could hand toss pizza behind my back and stuff, like really good, just trick stuff with it. And That's dope. when I was washing dishes, the pizza guy was struggling. He, you could just tell. So I walk up to him and I say, hey, buddy, is there anything I can do to help you? And he smugly looked at me and was like, yeah, if you could stretch pizza. So confidently, I went over there and just started hand tossing pizzas. The chefs, everyone just stopped what they were doing. It was like a movie. They all just stopped what they were doing and just all just turned and looked at me. And they're like, why didn't you tell us you could do this? I was like, I was just fresh That's awesome. fresh out of prison. I'm just, I just wanted a job, like get my foot in the door. And yeah, that was how my culinary career started. And just put myself in situations, you know. It's the, that's the OG yeah, way. Just yeah, just work hard because... I didn't start until I was 29 years old, so I had to work double, triple as hard as everyone else if I wanted to succeed and get to the uh, upper management, you know. So I just yeah. just really, really worked hard. Had a really good first chef. Um, if sometimes, like if you didn't have your top button button, he'd send you home. Um, and I always thought that he hated me because he would always come by and he would always say something to me. Where if the other guys weren't really working, he wouldn't say nothing. So I thought he just hated me. And then one day I got all mad and I was talking to this lady. Her name was Miss Cat. And I was talking to her and I was like, Miss Cat, Rudy hates me. And she's like, are you stupid? And I was like, what would you say to me? And she's like, are you stupid? She's like, Rudy wouldn't waste his time if he didn't believe in you. He was like, he would just Hmm. not say anything like he does. And then she gave a couple examples. And then I thought about that. And I was like, oh my God. And then from then on. I realized how good of a situation I had with Chef Rudy. He's by far the best chef I've ever worked for. That's awesome. That's good stuff. Yeah, and I just yeah, I mean, just kind of kept bouncing around a little bit, you know. Yeah, you still uh, keep in touch with him. Yeah, actually, no, that's awesome. That's good stuff. Yeah, 
Rudy was, uh, he was from San Diego. He never, ever has seen snow before. So and we're in Idaho. It's freezing. I mean, it's cold. We come outside and there's ice all over the car. And he's like, what do I do? And we're like, you get an ice scraper. He's like, what's that? And I pull it out of my truck. So I go over and scrape his window. And he's like, where do I get one of those? I'm like, Rudy, I know a guy that knows a guy, 40 bucks. And he's like, all right. He's getting ready to pull his wallet out. I'm like, no, Rudy, you can go to Walmart. They're like five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's good stuff yeah and then i just so oh, okay. yeah you go ahead so pizza you said when you're younger back home was the pizza before you had the run-in with going to prison yeah i yeah or... i was like 17 okay. or 18 when i started doing pizza with bimbo by chance do any cooking in in prison oh yeah yeah how, how was that yeah uh cooking in prison wasn't bad because you got to go sit down in the kitchen. Um, I mean, the food wasn't good, but you could eat as much of it as you want. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the prison kitchen was a, it was a sweet spot to be in prison, you know, because you go down okay. there. And basically the food is so easy to cook, you just try not to mess it up because it's just really, really low quality food. And you just got to cook for yeah. so many people. Um, yeah. You're literally in, it would take us like a half an hour just to tray up food. But yeah, there, half an hour. There was crazy stuff happened in the kitchen, fun stuff, you know. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> crazy. Like I, I think about like like mom and pop restaurants, and then banquets and catering, and like food trucks and stuff. I've never, you know, had the idea of thinking about how they do it in you know food in prison. You know, was it internal or external company? No, it was. It, and then they just employed the prison. No, so there was there was basically four guards that were certified to work in the kitchen. And then they had a dietary lady, and she was the one that came up with all of the um, all of the all of the menu and how many calories and everything. And then uh, we had a warehouse person, and they would order like the inmate inmates. Basically, we did every single thing in that kitchen. We even cooked for all the staff because every time, every day, the COs with the correctional officers would come in, they get a free meal. So you'd always have to cook them way better food than you got. So that was a little frustrating, but <laughs> yeah, no, but yeah, it's, that's, it's that's... you putting a bunch of people that have every different background, different belief. They're in there for way different things. And you just got to try to figure out a way to just maneuver without being seen or heard basically. <laughs> but yeah. the food quality in kitchen, yeah, it was, it was bad <laughs> stuff out of bags and cans and yeah. And they're like, throwaways from the grocery store type yeah, of thing the, like if the zucchini doesn't look perfect they don't use it like like they would we would get meat we'd get frozen meat and it would say for institutional use only and i don't i never and it would be oh yeah so they would just that's enough for me <laughs> yeah because the the lady um if i can remember correctly this was back in 2007 she had to feed us on 52 cents a meal Every inmate, fifty-two cents a meal. Oh so, my gosh! But they man. are buying; they're buying so much at a time. They get a deal. But even if you would buy just like regular hamburger or something, you you couldn't. So, yeah, that just gives you an example of what they had to work with. Wow. Once you got upstate, that was in the county. Once you got upstate, it was a little bit better. They fed you better. Yeah. I never worked in that kitchen though. Um, I do have a question yeah. for you. Um. Was it like that whole like cliche movie thing where like you can do like 150 different things with like ramen noodles from the comedy? <laughs> it truly, truly is. Um, because once you go in the state penitentiary, like we could order mackerel, we could order octopus, it would come octopus? so yeah, <laughs> so you know how you get tuna pouches nowadays, right? In the like the metal yeah. pouches, yeah, you could get like five different kind of seafood. That's all right, it's, I would have never guessed. In <laughs> the, the best thing ever that we used to make was this. We would make burritos. You could buy wraps, and we would make a cheesy mackerel rice mix and then just put that in burritos. It was amazing. Oh, gosh. That, really? Yeah. It really, it sounds disgusting. <laughs> so is this, is this purchasing it? <laughs> is it purchasing it from the commissary? Yeah. yeah. Once, and then yeah. you like in your cell, yeah. you kind of throw the stuff together with your uh, as your mates, yep. or once you get a once wow. you so the county jail is basically just a holding cell, and once you go upstate, it's for the people that have longer time, so you have a lot more amenities. Like when I was in county jail, a soup, like one ramen noodle would cost 
this was 2007, would cost you 65 cents. And then when I went upstate, it would cost me 17. So there was wow, just, because they weren't allowed to do that. And then you would have so much more selection. But when we were in the county, now that I look at it, um, I have I don't eat ramen. I haven't eaten a ramen noodle since I've been out. I will not eat that anymore. I've eaten so many ramen noodles in my life. Oh, I, I bet, bet you I have so much sodium in my body. <laughs> <laughs> or or the undigested noodles. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> Just chilling. Yeah. <laughs> Floating around. It's basically a run of the mill. What we called it, I did time in Pennsylvania. What we called it was a chi chi. It's basically you take noodles and it depends what else you could get. We'd always try to put chips in it. And then you would get cheese curls and you would crush them up. And mix them in, and that would be your cheese. And then they sold summer sausages. And then you just cut that up there and throw it in there, and that was it. But the cre- That's it, it is. And once you're away from that situation, you realize how insane that is. How happy. Yeah. Just because, you know, you're in prison, you don't have too much. That disgusting right. little meal felt like heaven. <laughs> that yeah, but once you got a... It's probably like a week's worth of sodium yeah. in like one yeah. meal. Once you got upstate, though, if you knew the right people, they like because they would cook with real food up there, so you could get vegetables. Yeah. I could get tomatoes. I can get all kind of spices and stuff like that. Um, and we used to, because upstate, there's a thing you plug in your wall. You just take an extension cord, cut it, cut the end of the extension cord off, plug it into the wall, and you separate them two wires, and you just make sure they don't touch. And if you put yeah. that in salt water. That will start boiling that water. So you just have a. We, That's dope. We used to. Um, they would, they would, yes, it was. I blew out the whole. Listen, and seventy percent of the people were from Philadelphia. The World Series was going on, and the Phillies were playing. And I blew out the entire electric for one half of the block. There was like ten oh, dudes shit. trying to find out who did it. They were going to kill somebody. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, That's crazy. You could get. Sometimes like you could buy a, you could buy a bagel on commissary and then twice a week we get hard boiled eggs. So we'd take them hard boiled eggs and we'd get some ham, hard boiled eggs and uh, just make a spread with some mayonnaise and put that in a bag and put it in the boiling water and it would come out like a hot bagel. Like if them prison ham salad, yeah, if them people in prison would just devote some of that knowledge and MacGyverness outside, they could they could do anything. Yeah, I was I was just about to uh, to ask the have you used any or like taken what you did in prison and kind of added it to your you know your growth oh. that you've had over the last few years? Oh or yeah, more than that. Prison. Um, so I can't say prison changed me. Prison got me away from the situation I was in for five years, so it gave me a different perspective and. Okay. You're literally locked up with every type of person you can imagine, right? So you get to see everybody's basically the same, you know? So when you get out, it gives you a good perspective. And it's how you do your time. Um, I mainly read books and worked out. Love playing handball, stuff like that. Um, other people, if you do your time wrong, you just go in there and just gamble and just just – try to be gangster, it's not going to work out well for you. You know, you have to do the time. Don't let the time do you. But it gives, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for me going to prison. It gives me a good perspective on, because I don't want to go back there. Yeah. I know it sounds crazy, but prison was kind of easy for me. It's really hard on my loved ones. Um, Because once you get into the emotion of prison, I know it sounds crazy, but you get used to it. And it's just seeing your loved ones out there suffering, you know, and you can't do nothing. Like my grandmother and grandfather yeah. both passed when I was in prison. And it was extremely hard <sighs> not being able to comfort my mother. You right. know? So it's just things yeah, like that's... that. So that's a big one. I always want to be there for my mother, you know, because that's her hardest time in her life. And I wasn't there. So I always try to keep that, you know. So I can imagine, I mean, probably the easiest thing for you in prison was just getting a routine, right? Yep. You just got to just get connected with like-minded people. Uh, don't don't gamble money you don't have. And that is the key is yeah. get a routine. Um, just like the military, if you get a set schedule and get used to doing the same thing, it's comforting. And in prison, not too many things are comforting. You know, but doing the same thing over and over again is super 
super comforting. Like you said, I would do the same thing, same workout, like not same muscles, but basically the same routine six days a week. And then on Sundays, I would watch football and just chill. But you you have to keep your mind occupied. You can't just go in there and just not want to do anything. Like I just, I try to read at least two books a week. Um, but wow. we had TV, like I had a TV and cable in my cell. Like if you were, hmm. yeah, wow. you could buy a TV. And if you, but that was their thing. In order to keep that, you had to be good. So if you were bad, they took the TV. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so you just Crazy. yeah, so like when Breaking Bad and all them shows were coming out, Sons of Anarchy, everyone, we were all in prison just watching it. Wow, interesting. That's but nice. it That's it cool. seems like it keeps people, it gives people something to do, and it gives them something to take away. So it seems like it makes the behavior better. But I don't, I'm right. not sure. So you get out of prison, you go to what, yard house, yeah. yard house, yep. and you're a dishwasher, and you, and then. After you start slinging some pizzas, you're, uh, what's after that? I actually just started working my way down the line. I learned uh, pantry, fry, grill, and then saute. I was just on a run. <clears throat> I just, that's yeah, awesome. I just uh, learned everything I could. Um, did, everything. Did you move into your first sous chef position? No, no, no. I got that at a, it's a place down in Salt Lake. I was just getting the, the lead line cook position at Twigs, and my wife, which was my girlfriend then, um, she got a, a general manager's job in Salt Lake City. So, so oh, I came wow. down here and <laughs> Salt Lake City, um, it's a Mormon Mormon state. So the alcohol right. laws are very crazy. Like before you couldn't have beer if it was over 3.5%, okay? 3.5%. Wow. So yeah, and Yard House's whole shtick is to have like 52 beer, you know, 150 beers or whatever. And I, I don't yeah. think they make a hundred beers under three and a half percent. Um, they, they've relaxed the laws lately in the last couple of years. Um, so I didn't have anywhere to transfer to. <clears throat> so the yard house was part of Darden. And then I came down and, um, I didn't want to, I, so I went to Olive Garden and I went in there and I lasted one week. It was, um, really? it was literally a, a factory line. Like they they don't cook anything. The only thing that's cooked in house is the Alfredo, but they don't even cook all of that from scratch. It comes in bags. And it was it was huh. just there was no cooking involved. It was just putting things together. And yeah. when I worked for Yard House at the time, it was uh I first worked there, it wasn't corporate. We did almost everything from scratch. So go huh. from there to um that was just troubling. I just couldn't do it. I just told him, I was like, I'm sorry, I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, I would be the same. Yeah, way. it was just, 100%. I heard stories, but I didn't, like, I just didn't believe it. But yeah, nothing is cooked in house. Not one thing is like made there. Like, even the. What about the pasta? No. I mean, they, they, so they would. Uh, so they just buy in dried yeah. pasta and then you like boil yeah, it Yeah, they or just buy pasta. Yeah, nothing. The breadsticks are all shipped in, already pre made. Wow. They just heat them up. So yeah. So that's why. Yeah. So coming from that to that, I was a shocker. So then my wife works at, um, she works at an outdoor mall. They're very big out West. So these outdoor malls, right? Oh yeah. That's um, weird. so she got a job there and there was a place. Um, so I went and she's like, I seen a bunch of, uh, young guys coming out. And she's like, you should go apply. So I went and applied and, and the chef heard that I worked at yard house and, um, I wanted more money than they were ready to offer. But the chef's like, You've worked at Yard House for three years? I was like, yeah, he's like, hire him. Give him what he wants. So I was like, wow. <laughs> That's cool. I guess Yard House has a little bit of weight. I don't know what it's done now. It's been probably seven years, eight or No, it's been longer than that. It's been about eight years since yeah. I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, they have, what, like three out here in Las Vegas? I think so. Something like that? I know they have one at the Red Rock, I think. They have one at the Link, too. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. so probably three. Yeah, yeah I... I that was one of them things like I'd go back to Yard House to to eat. It's probably the the best family kitchen I ever had. Like, uh, yeah, we would go like night fishing after work, like as a crew. There would be oh, like that's awesome. six or seven of us, you know. And I'm just fresh out of prison, so I'm going into the wilderness in Idaho, like just and we're going sturgeon fishing for seven foot long fish. You know, and I'm just like, oh, it's like, wow, that's fucking wild. It's only, yeah, you can go sturgeon fishing literally like a half an hour drive 
from um, downtown Boise. Yeah. Um, That's cool. Yeah, I don't That's for all the fishing cool. people yeah, those out there. I caught a two. Sturgeons are monsters. Yes, never yeah. caught one, though. I've seen the guy beside us catch one. It was just, this is a dinosaur, basically, what it looks like. <laughs> yep. And then caviar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that's what we yep, should have done. So. That's crazy. Yeah, they um, that's they're protect. They're severely protected. You're not even allowed to take them out of the water. Like you'll get fined if you t- even like try to take it out of the water. But yeah, that's crazy. I didn't know that. I mean, I know that like like caviar is like super um like regulated and shit. But I didn't realize the fish like that's so. Crazy. And it's there's different. Um, I learned this from fishing for them. So the caviar from those sturgeon, I think they're white sturgeon. They, it'd be amazing, yeah. but it's not even close to the um, the Caspian Sea version. Um, I'm trying to think of the name hmm. of it, but yeah, so it's a, it's different. But yeah, they there's pictures of them. We almost killed them all. <laughs> there's pictures of them like Jeez. ten foot sturgeon. But yeah, I I, I I thought about that too about the caviar because <laughs> you think how much caviar is a six foot fish going to have in it? It's a gold <laughs> yeah. mine itself. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. Yeah, boy, yeah, and like the recently, caviar has been getting like, um, was it like Russian yeah. tin can caviar that's like imported, and they're trying to. It's been like, from what I've heard, it's been not so good, not what it like used to be. So yeah, so uh, China they they figure out a way to farm raise caviar now, and they don't have to kill the uh, fish. So a lot of um, inferior caviar is getting flooded in so caviar should be cheaper like you can i mean not the good stuff but you can get lower grade caviar now for cheaper hmm. I, was, I don't know for me caviar is kind of like truffles it's just like it's not really that great but people just like it only because it's expensive yeah, it's, it's name yeah. value yeah yeah and like the the slices of truffles that they i don't like the slices of truffles when they take the, the <laughs> truffle board and they're like slicing it i'm like you, you just covered my whole dish and like <laughs> fungus like, i don't know my first steakhouse job uh we used to actually keep uh truffles in like a mason jar type yeah. deal and whenever we had to do it for like uh we did it around like new year's eve every time somebody ordered a truffle add-on to a dish they would just pop it open it was like a grenade just went off the entire kitchen stink just reeked yes. of truffles and now every time i smell them it just uh, yes uh. you know we, <laughs> we have uh Perfumed truffle oil or whatever that yeah. that stuff is horrible too. You crack that open that, and you're like, listen, oh, oh. That, oh. that's that stuff. So the last uh, the last uh, steak dish we did, I went out, had to go table side and shave truffles for every every person that ordered the special. <laughs> oh man, no, I, I I actually enjoy going out because it's a smaller place. So um, and you know, like as chefs. I don't know if you guys get to or not to go out and talk to tables, but we're, we're, we're fucking rock stars. People love the chef. Yeah. Especially you go out and talk to them and make them feel, you know, make them feel like they're part of it. Yeah. They, they just love it. I don't know. Maybe I like the, uh, the attention. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, I don't really get to go out to talk to any guests. And if I do, it's cause I'm trying to put out a fire. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, I work in a smaller place. So, um, <clears throat> if yeah. I got time, a little more intimate, yeah, because which is nice. We got awarded the seventh best German restaurant in the country by Yelp, by reviews. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, I would always go out and always go out and talk to them and just just make friends, just make them feel comforted. Go out and explain the food to them because German food, a lot of people have no clue. Like even when I started, I barely knew anything about German food. So – just go out there and explain it to them. Is that them. like what schnitzel yeah. and sauerkraut and all that? Stuff? Yeah, yeah. I had like the basics, you know. Um, well, yeah. working in that kitchen, I learned that the Germans stole a lot of their cooking techniques from the French. Yeah. You know, so, but yeah, I, I, uh, I like cooking uh, different foods. So cooking, learning how to cook German from scratch, and and the owner of uh, the bistro, he's from. Uh, Germany. He's been here for about 15 years now. Um, okay. So if I make something, you know, and he says it's good, then I know it's good. Because a lot of the stuff I gotta, I gotta research and look up. You know, a lot of the, like sauerbrot is a German beef dish, and you marinate it in red wine vinegar and some other spices for what is it, four to ten days, and then four to ten. Yes, days. and then you braise it. Wow. Okay. It's like and. 
like pastrami. It, it comes out well, purplish. At this point in time, we lost Chef Henry, and uh, we worked to get him back and connected, and we continue talking about his life, the kitchen, culinary, food, knife skills, and it's a great podcast episode, so please continue to listen, and thank you for tuning in. So yeah, he's he's been in America for about 15 years now. Um, it's just good working for somebody else. He has a different perspective about everything being European. Yeah. You know, so it, it's a big difference for him. You know, like over in Europe, like where he left, everybody goes to college for free. Um, they get 30 days a year off, like paid vacation. Yeah, I've so, always thought that's kind of crazy. Yep. That's a different conversation for a different day. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Just, but, yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, just love cooking. Uh, one of my favorite styles of cooking is actually wok cooking. Wok? Right? Nice. It's one of the hardest styles of cooking I've ever, ever done. But it is super rewarding because the wok is so hot. You throw your oil in. If you throw your garlic in, you better have your next ingredient in, in four seconds or the garlic's burning. <laughs> yep. Right. But so uh Walk in K. Vegas, yeah, in <laughs> Vegas they you know they used to give out Michelin stars. Yeah, well, there's a there's a Chinese restaurant that they got a they got a Michelin star down there. I can't remember the name of it. I wanted to go last time I went to Vegas, but I didn't. But they had regular Chinese food like all of us would recognize. And I just wonder how good it has to be for them to get a Michelin star serving Kung Pao chicken. You oh. know, <laughs> I always thought about that. Do you I know mean, what? Do you know what restaurant that is, Randy? Um, there's so many Chinese places out here with a Michelin star. With a Michelin star. I mean, uh, they used to do it back in the day. I don't know if they do it anymore because of like how the whole environment is out here. It's all based on just volume versus quality. I mean, yeah. you can still find some really high-end restaurants out here, but I mean, because of, I mean, I, will, I don't want to say the union, but. Yeah, let's not uh, talk yeah. about that. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I really like Ping Pang Pong's, which is like a well-known Chinese spot at the Gold Coast. Um, their food's really good, but it doesn't have a Michelin star. No. But the food, it's like really good. So Yeah, yeah we have a lot of um, different because the Mormons, they go out and they put out missionaries everywhere around the world. So I live in like a littler town outside of Salt Lake. And within like a half a mile, there's like literally seven different nationality food places. Hmm. That's dope. That's awesome. Like, yeah. yeah, there's like, there's just so many. There's an Argentinian place. Like it was just, there's just so many different. There's, of course, there's a Japanese, Chinese. There's tons of Hawaiian food in Utah. Yeah, there, yeah, I've heard that too. We have um, back in Hawaii that had the um, I think a bite outlet of BYU, um, mm. and uh, <laughs> yep. the LDS Church has a huge facility out um, out on the uh, east side uh, on Oahu. So, but yeah, I mean that's awesome, man. Going, you know, Chef Randy was telling me before he moved uh, back to Vegas he, where he was. It was like there was like nothing, and it was like. He missed the, I mean, you can share about it. I mean, uh, I went to uh, North, uh, like North, North, North Maine. Uh, like I could literally see Canada from like the window outside of the uh, restaurant that I was at. <laughs> um, it was um, like a 45 minute drive to see a stoplight. And it was about an fucking hour and 15 minute drive to go to Walmart. Uh, it was all just small mom and pop places. And uh, it was like potato country out there as well. And everybody just like wanted like poutines and stuff like that. They call it a poutine <laughs> up there, whatever. But uh, I made a chimichurri one time and they were just like, what the fuck is this? That's sad. She just blew their minds of like, a, it's a chimichurri, dude. It took me like 10 minutes. Yeah. Trying to explain it. <laughs> yeah, trying to explain it. And they're just like, it's a what now? What's a cilantro? Tell them it's South American really? pesto. like that up there? Oh, <laughs> just a bunch of honkies. Oh, man. That's crazy. <laughs> so it's, it's South American pesto. <laughs> yeah. South American pesto. That's a good one. Yeah, that is good. I like that. So with all of these uh, cuisines, what's your favorite? Ah, uh, Mexican food. I, I know I have Italian heritage. Italian's my favorite thing to cook. But if I can get really good Mexican food, it's just, I don't know, it's just just it's something good. about it. all the flavors, the technique. Yeah. And part, part of it's the people. You see them, you know, you see them back there cooking and 
it's just just something about it. It's just comfort food on a yeah, whole other level. Yeah, they really take the like fat, acid, heat, salt to the whole next level. I love I love like tacos and their their soups and stews. It's great. Yeah, because you can go. There's just so many different things. I fell in love with it when I was a chef at that Mexican place. Um, but then I always try to stop at all the Mexican food trucks I can to try different things. You know, um, like one of my favorite tacos is cabeza. I don't know how they cook it, but it, cabeza means head. So it's some part of the cow's head. I don't know what it is, but it's amazing. Yeah, just the way they cook it. Yeah, my f- and, my favorite taco is lengua. Yeah, same here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good old Lingua. fat cow tongue boiled in a beautiful broth, chopped up with some cilantro and onions. Oh, yeah, and I like. Do love me a good pozole, though. Oh, oh man. Yeah, I love pozole. There's just so. Is that the dude, red or green version? The red version. Yeah. There's just so much yeah. you can do with it, you know? But yeah, I uh, my favorite thing I like cooking personally is fried chicken. I love fried chicken. I love making like fried chicken sandwiches, but I also just making fried chicken. What technique do you use? Do you use like a Machiko style or what's your breading? I usually, it just depends on what I'm doing. But if I'm just doing like, say like a Nashville chicken or a Buffalo chicken sandwich, I usually uh, do buttermilk, Tabasco and eggs and just let that marinate for a while. And then I just add a flour and a bunch of seasonings. Um, but I also sometimes use, I know it sound crazy. Corn flakes as a breading for the oh, fried yeah, chicken. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know if that was like well known or not. So good. Yeah. Yeah. My, I, uh, uh, old roommate uh, made me some fried uh, chicken with the corn flake batter thing he made. It was fucking awesome. So, yeah, yeah. I like simple foods. I come for like, so basically, uh, my grandmother lived like two blocks away from me. So I'd always go over there and eat her Italian food all the time. But I didn't have any other experience with any other food because we were pretty poor growing up. So I didn't ever, I never really ever went out to eat. So I didn't have any real experiences except for really good Italian food. Like I always thought tacos was just, you know, the ground beef, you know, with the taco flavor, with the taco right. seasoning, things right. like that. <clears throat> so it really took me uh, <clears throat> becoming a, a, a line cook to really start venturing out into trying different foods. Yeah, building that palate. It's it's crazy. Like when you're when you tell people you're a chef and and they're like, "Oh my god, you make us soul food." And and you know, you're making all this like super awesome, flavorful stuff and they're like, "Uh, oh, I don't like that." I'm like, Dude, "You got to build your palate. Come on." People That's why I don't yeah. People want they want butter, cream, <laughs> like alfredo's like butter cream and fucking you know, what I mean, garlic, lemon juice. Yeah, it's like, come on, guys, build your palate. Like, like I used to hate tomatoes, but I cannot go and have a burger without a nice sliced, salted, and peppered tomato. Yeah, I was the same way with onions for years, and then I went to prison, and if I didn't eat them onions, I was going to be hungry. So I realized real quick I actually liked onions. Yeah, and there's so many different types of onions. And they're so delicious. I love onions. I absolutely adore them. That's kind of it's weird. like it's like it's like Bubba Gump from Forrest Gump. When he's talking <laughs> yeah. about like shrimp sandwiches, yeah. you know, green onions, red onions, yep. scallions, Chip, the, you know, chipolinis, <laughs> Vidalia, <laughs> shallots. Yeah. Then you, you can steam them. You can fry yeah. them. <laughs> the onion. So now that we're on onions, I know it's super squirrely, but what uh, what knife cut is your favorite knife cut? I mean, there's just so much different, but the first, I don't know, just probably the Julian. Yeah. Just I like the at the 40 degree angle, so they all turn out around the same size. Yep. Yes. Um, yeah. When I'm at home, that's what I use. But, you know, different applications, different things. Like for a salad, obviously, you've got to cut it a little bit thinner. Than yep. if I was making caramelized onions. Yep. But that 40 degree knife tilt makes a difference. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I try to show people that at work all the time. And I'm like, why are you, you, you don't go straight up and down? Cause you leave these fat pieces off the ends. But yeah, I like Julian. You can, you know, thick, really nice shaved Julian for, um, like you said, salads and stuff, but caramelized onions, raw onions, grilled onions. I love them all. I'm going to, uh, I- 
I'm with you. I have a garden outside and I have three different onions. <laughs> what uh, What's your favorite knife? So my favorite one at the moment. I'll give you that one. I have, I have a bunch. Um, I have a bunch. My favorite one right now is the is the Dow Strong. They have the Valhalla edition. Ooh, how and are those? Sick. It, it's great. It's everybody in the kitchen. If I ever let them use, it, they all love it because it could be used as a chopper, a chef knife, um, and the handle. It just just it looks slick. Um, I got into and then I started buying some Hankel knives and stuff like that. Some German knives. Um, I did at first. I'm trying to think of the exact company. I have this knife I bought off my first chef. They're they're known for making samurai swords. Like they were making samurai swords for like 400 years, and they started making chef knives. So I bought this chef knife for like 300 dollars off my chef, and um, it's one of the most amazing knives ever. It gets so super duper sharp, but it gets dull so fast. Yeah, so I it's have, a little uh... frustrating. I agree with you on the Dow Strong. I have a, uh, I believe it's the Shadow Black series chef knife. I think it, I don't know the length, but it's thin and long, and I use it almost for everything. Uh, Cleaning brisket, cutting cutting Julian onions, scallions, just like fish. It's, I use it for everything. It holds its um, sharpness really well. Yes, it does. And it's, it's kind of easy to like clean it up with a, like a steel. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've used it for so, so much recently. I need to actually get a, you know, a nice sharp, uh, um, what, like a stone. Yes. Thank you. This, you know, a good run on the stone. I know you just picked up that tumbler thing and yeah. Did you ever see anything about that on Facebook? Like when you're scrolling through, it's like that ad where that like little magnet. round one, the yeah. magnet, like, the, yeah, I, 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 did you get it? Yeah, I bought it. How is it? Um, I mean, it's definitely got its flaws, but I mean, overall it works pretty well. Yeah. It's the way it's set up and the angles, not every knife is going to be 15 degrees or 20 degrees, but you got to put the type of edge for that like roller on your knife. And it takes probably 10 minutes each side to go. And you got to go slow. Like in the video, they're going fast and it's like, Oh my God, it's, you know, it's sharp, but you got to put an edge on it first, both sides and then clean it up. And then once you get that going, maintenance is, you know, pretty quick. Um, I I mess around with it on one of my uh, Mercer knives it was a couple days ago, and it seemed to put a nice edge on it, and I could work with the edge. Cut paper. Yeah, the next day I brought it into work, and uh, I sharpened a couple knives, one of, uh, a few of them for my uh, executive. And, um, I mean, it took a little bit of practice to get used to it, and uh, it kind of, like, bends the tip of the knife back when you're actually going towards uh, the – end of it but uh, other than that i mean for small knives you kind of have to like get your fingers underneath to prop it up so it doesn't slide down but other than that i mean it works pretty well i mean it does what it says it does it's funny you brought that up because one of my uh cooks came up to me about two weeks and was showing me a i don't know it was a tiktok or youtube video about that and he's like what do you think and i was like i haven't heard nothing about it yeah we're, we're not sponsored but you know it's no, i'm just kidding <laughs> it's just, not hey not, not yet yeah. Yeah. Yep. But it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty. I mean, it's cool. It's you know, it's quick. You know, you don't have to like move, change out the different uh, stones and make sure the stones flat before you sharpen your knife. And then having the right angle, it sets it all up for you. And I I seen another one that like mounts to the table and then it, like it's like a whole contraption thing, thing. that looks kind of cool. But I like this one a little bit better. I might actually purchase one for myself for my work, or I might get my work to purchase one for the kitchen. That uh, sounds like a better plan. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's cool. I, um, it takes a little bit of practice, but it's definitely worth it. Uh, I think out the door with like the leather strap and everything like that, it was like 135 and it got here in about a week. Was it really that much? Yeah, it was like 135. Oh, wow. And it's heavy. It's super heavy. It is heavy. Yeah. I have a buddy. Um, he is so into sharpening knives. Like that is his hobby. Yeah. It's definitely an art. And like he like like every once in a while he'll bring something in, he'll bring in like a butter knife and you could shave with it. And I'll be like, butter dude, knife. you need a you need a new hobby or you need to turn this into a business. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, yeah, for sure. Wow. That's dope. Because yeah. you know, if you have a passion for something. Absolutely. Yeah. So so with moving up, I know you I don't know if you mentioned uh but you're now an executive chef of that of the German restaurant? Yeah. And they also have a food truck. What kind of topics and 
tips can you share with the audience to kind of maybe help them move through their career and maybe, right? Because you pretty much, you kind of started at the bottom and you worked your way up through now we're here. hours and hours. Yeah. And now we're here. Hours and hours and hours of hard work. You know, you're probably first one in, last one out type of thing like that. So could you share with the audience? Yeah. The big thing is you have to know what you want. Okay. Like if you, if you want to be the chef, you know that you got to go and do all this extra stuff. Okay. If you, if it's just a job for you right now, um, then that's a whole different ball game. You don't have to, you, if you want to be the chef, you got to put in the work basically is what I'm trying to say. You can't half ass it. All right. You got to know what you want and know your value. All right. Biggest thing I always say to all my, all my cooks is learn, learn, learn. The more you learn, the more, you know, the more, you know, the more valuable you are, the more valuable are, the more money you make. Yep. 110%. It's just knowing if you want to be the chef, then you got to, you got to know what you want. You got to realize you're going to work 50 plus hours a week. Um, most times, all right. Some places, you know, you're going to be on your day off. You're going to get called in. You no, know? you're going to have to be the face of the company. So if that's not what you want, don't, you just got to have realistic goals. If that's what you want, you have to strive for it. Um, yeah. and, Put yourself in situations because, like I said, my career has been a lot of luck. But I put myself in situations to um, to take advantage of that luck. Right? And just be passionate about anything you do. I don't care if you're throwing the trash away. Right? Do the best job you can. Yep. And, like, advocate for yourself, too. If you think they're going to ask you, hey, do you want to be the lead cook or cook one, cook two, cook three? Hey, do you want to be a sous chef? Hey, do you want to be? They're not going to ask you. You got to be your own advocate. That's kind of how I, you know, feel. Kind of, no, you don't ask, yeah. you're not going to get. If you don't knock, the door won't be open unto you. I got a good one for you. A closed mouth doesn't get fed. Yep. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. <laughs> no, but that's it. In you just got to know your value and your worth. Um, but the biggest thing is a good attitude. I can teach anybody to cook. Okay, you can't teach attitude. I, I, I cannot teach someone to have a good attitude. Yeah. Right. And I know people have bad days. People have things going on. But everyone has things going on. If you want to truly be a good chef, someone that they like to work with, you got to figure out a way to be happy. Because if you're not happy, nobody in your life's going to be happy. If you have a wife. You're coming home. If you're not happy, you're taking out on her. If you got kids, you know. So being happy is a big, big thing. At least to me, it is. Yeah. No. That absolutely one hundred percent. And and being negative and your attitude, it can it can kill the culture in the kitchen. And at like Randy loves to say that you know at the end of the day you're affecting the guest because then the food shit, your day shit, and it just at the end of the day it affects. The, the guests yeah. and those are the people that we're here to cook for and to have a great experience one thing i do like to say is um i am just a sous chef right now i'm not the executive but uh at this at the end of the day um i'm passionate about what i do i'm a chef i've been doing this for like what 15 years um these people that are coming in are not customers this is my house these people are my guests that's how i view it i'm not giving somebody something for a payment i'm feeding and nourishing them they are here for that that's why mind body and soul mind body and soul 100 percent. so i don't refer to people as customers i refer to them as guests that's that whole adage without them we have nothing exactly they pay our bills yep it's just like uh like you said like if if the crew if they're happy they're laughing they're joking they're dancing around food's gonna be better oh yeah if every if if somebody flipped out and everyone somebody slamming pans and all that other stuff. So it, attitude, I believe that as a chef, my job is probably 70% mental. Yeah. Like dealing with, because you know, when you're a line cook, um, line cook Billy's problems over there, there's nothing for you to deal with. But once you become the chef, everyone's problems become your problems. So people don't understand. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's it can get stressful, yeah. you know. So, and, but yeah, just be happy. It's like that song. 
don't worry, be happy. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and it's, it's funny, like a lot of cooks and stuff, like if they're not in the game and they're there stare for a paycheck, they always complain about, man, they charge so much and they make so much money, but they, they don't understand like food cost, labor costs, running a business and the small little things like towel service and everything like that. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, you guys make so much now. Hold up now. Slow your roll. You know, take the time to understand what's going on and just make sure you want to be there. And if you don't want to be there, don't. Yeah, there's the door. Listen, we we actually agree fully on this. If you're not happy, what are you doing here? Yeah. Okay, like there's plenty of other places they're hiring. You know, if this isn't what you're doing, then there's the door. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's not even trying to be rude or anything like that. It's just like, hey, I mean, if you're not willing to learn or anything like that, if you're not taking this seriously, I can find somebody else that will take this seriously and will want to be here. So just yeah, but, do us all a favor. You know, as chefs, you, we can change people's lives. Yeah, exactly. You know, like <clears throat> if some, you know, like we can give people a career. You know, so um, if you're holding that spot back from somebody that could really use it, yep making those decisions to to hire people and all that that's yeah that's moving into like i'm i'm involved in food cost ordering stock inventory menu writing scheduling payroll reconciliation human resources stuff that i can handle before i have to transfer you know they the way the company set up they i i take handle most of the stuff and if i can't figure it out then i send it to the the hr office so it's being a you know a chef or sous chef, somebody that's in a uh, executive or managerial position, it's it's a totally different mindset. And if you don't have that as a line cook, it's going to be very difficult to build that and move up. If you don't set like you said, you know, know what you want and and work for it. It's just like like if you look at a very good dishwasher, usually they will equate to a good line cook. A hundred percent, all the time. Does that make sense? Yeah, like absolutely. If, if they can do that, they can do that. Just like if someone is a very good line cook, um, it, but it doesn't equate because you have to have a certain level of personality. You have to be personable with people. You can't. This is, we're not. I'm not good like Gordon Ramsay. I just can't yell at people. You know, it's not going to fly. So you gotta you gotta be able to talk to people. You gotta be empathetic, but also at the same point, you have to be stern. You know, so. It's a little bit different, but I always said that about dishwashers, you know, it's always. Yeah. You and, uh, you and me are, I mean, that's where I got my start as a dishwasher. You know, like I, I do not have a culinary degree, never went to culinary school. I started as a dishwasher, washing dishes at a, uh, fairly famous breakfast spot back home and peeling potatoes and cracking eggs to because they went through so much home fries and so much eggs for a breakfast spot right so i'm doing i'm cracking eggs for five five gallon buckets cutting potatoes for just you know bags and bags and 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 then just taking the initiative to do more and do more and ask hey can i do this hey can you show me how to do this hey what's this hey you know and now i'm in a place where i feel i have a very good grasp on the overall cooking recipes and my palates fairly well built that I can keep moving up and, and uh, potentially one day be a, an executive chef or senior executive chef or whatever there. The yeah. Is. Cause you know, I still, I have a long way to go. That's not about cooking. There's always something to do. I have a long way to go. Um, cooking wise, you know, um, meaning like there's still so much in my chef life I could learn, Yep. you know, and, and you just, I always try to listen no matter, I don't care if the dishwasher is trying to give me advice. I always try to listen. You know, just, you never know. Yep. Just be open. You can always learn something from everybody. Yep. E- exactly. You don't never know where it'll come from. Yeah. My, and, my uh, current executive chef is, he's the same way. He's like, make sure you, you're listening to everybody's opinions and, and questions and comments. And, and if they're good, implement them. You know, it kind of shows, you know, that you care about them and that, you know, you respect that their, their idea and, and it, it kind of gives a little fulfillment to them. You know? Yeah, it's such a boost of confidence for the employee. You know, I fully agree with you. I do have one random off the topic question for you. Yeah. Uh, so you said your wife is a general manager. Yeah. Uh, how's that going? Like, uh, like, do you guys have similar schedules, or I mean, does it like always turn into like a front of the house versus back of the house thing? Oh no, she 
She uh, she actually is the general manager of a candy store. She's not the GM oh. of a restaurant. Okay. <laughs> no, I could not work with my wife. No, no? not one bit. <laughs> not one bit. <laughs> how how do you manage the relationship with the amount of hours you work? Because I know you're probably still working fifty plus hours a week. Yeah, I I, just, I have a great wife. Um, she's very understanding. Um, you know, uh, she knows what the goals are and she sees how far, cause she started dating me when I was a dishwasher. So now I'm an executive chef. So she sees the path that I've, I've gone down and a big part of it's her and her supporting me. So I got really lucky with that. Cause I know a lot of guys, um, when they're trying to work up, their girlfriends are always complaining cause they're never at home or, or they can't do this or they can't do that. You know, so I got very, very lucky with that. Um, and I try to keep, uh, I, me and my wife try to go somewhere at least once every two months. Like we go to Nevada every once in a while. Okay. Um, there's a place down there called Wendover. It's right by the Bonneville Salt Flat. The you ever been to the That's Bonneville the Speedway? No. The salt Flats? Okay. Well, there's this big, giant 15-mile salt flat, and they're just where they set a bunch of the world records for speed, like oh, land Lance records. Burgers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So, it, and there's a little town right on the other side. Um, it's funny. The parking lot for the casino is in Utah, but oh. the casino is in Nevada. And then there's like, there's five national parks in Utah. Yeah. So um, we're, we're in the mountains. So there's so much stuff and there's hot springs, like natural hot springs, uh, places around here. So I always try to keep uh, a balance, like you work life balance, you know, but yeah. when you work a lot, it's harder, but you just got to, and the owner's very good about not calling me in on my days off. Well, so that good. really helps. But I know a lot of the times that's not everyone's experience, um, right. but you just got to keep the, the the goal in mind. What are you doing? You know, why are you here? What are you doing? Yep. And then, you know, cause if that's what you want, you've got to put in the work. And if your loved one um, doesn't think that's right for you, then they need to talk to you and let you know. Yeah. Or, you know? hey, here's the door. <laughs> yeah, I didn't honest. want to say that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I I work ridiculous hours. I think I, we, we kind of talked about this a little bit last episode. Um, like one day I had a 8 a.m. shift and I had like, three different party or one party that was flipped two different menus um i got in at eight had to be set by one flipped by four forty five to five and then it was over at seven thirty, and we had to be or over at seven it had to be out of there no later than seven thirty to flip to a different party that i wasn't involved in and then at eight i had to go and carve for a carving station until like <laughs> one in the morning so i worked 8 a.m to 1 a.m and then I went back to the office, finished some emails, and then went home, got home about 2.30, and uh, had to be back at work at, I think, 10 a.m. the next day for the following following event and stuff. So it, I work 60-plus hours a week. It's hard to manage um, a relationship. Work-life balance is a little bit of a struggle for me. Uh, Randy's gotten it pretty down pretty well. I just have a solid routine. I wake up, I go to the gym, I go to work, I go home, I go to sleep. That's it. Like literally that's it. It's kind of, yeah. it's, it's rough for me to, to set that up, to be honest, it's, but I got to do it and I'm going to be doing it. And, uh, but it's hard to fit a partner during that. So yeah. But you, you're going to be, a, you're going to be a better person after you work all these 70 hour weeks. It'll build character. <laughs> oh, yeah, for, for sure i've been doing it for a while now so no yeah uh it's it's tough but you just got to find the right person that that's the best advice i can give you and try to keep some kind of like a routine like like your man said it's perfect you just got to find something in the job if you're working 60 hours a week and if you hate your job it's way worse than if you actually enjoy coming to work that's the big thing yeah, you just got to enjoy what you do. Yeah, I've quit a chef job to go be a line cook once, you know. I, yeah. <laughs> just because I wasn't happy and nothing in my life was happy, but it worked out well in the end. A hundred percent. So now the uh, the topic of the uh, the coveted Facebook page. <laughs> how, did, uh, how did that get started? How do you feel about it? And kind of just because uh, it's uh, pretty pretty awesome, and I think in personally. Yeah. So uh, 
I love Lord of the Rings. I'm a Lord of the Rings nerd. Like, right on. Uh, right now, I even like every day, I wear the One Ring around my neck. That's awesome. My, uh, <laughs> I went about a ten karat gold. Uh, my best friend is a loves Lord of the Rings. I love Lord of the Rings too, but he did the full like three and a half weeks. Got a van, went to New Zealand, and went to like everything Lord of the Rings. Oh man, so jelly. Yeah, I was super jealous. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so uh, I worked. Like I said, it was my the first row kitchen job and um i it was like a family there so i figured a good way because we'd always come in and show each other our phone like hey look at this meme look at this meme or um and i was hoping that it could be a place to share memes and share recipes so that somebody in philadelphia had a great cheesesteak recipe somebody in utah could use it you know that was the the meaning it never turned out to be that yeah. it turned out to something completely different but yeah i i never expected to run a group with 140,000 members in it yeah you know so um, are you it, kind of slightly are you slightly disappointed in the route that it's gone or you're just kind of maybe slightly in shock or it's like having you know like if your child ends up in prison you, know, you still love them <laughs> okay. Fair no, they, yeah, I uh, I'm very big about joking around, talking shit in the kitchen. But some of, I'm very sometimes yes, definitely disappointed in the group. Like some of the stuff that goes on in there. Like I remember, basically the group got this one lady's business shut down. What? The one cook. What? Oh my god! One, you you that. didn't hear about that one? No, so, did not. So the lady fight. And I don't know if this was um, warranted or not. I didn't want to delve into it. I didn't want to know more than I already knew. So this lady um, messages me and tells me she's suing me. She's suing the Facebook group because we've ruined her business. And I was like, what are you talking about? And then I go and do a little bit of research. And one of her employees she fired went and left, put a thing up on the Facebook group, like, go leave negative reviews. And I guess like 30 people went and gave her one star reviews. And, oh, and that's fucked up. Yeah. And then like, you know, um, jokes and stuff's fun, but that's like someone's livelihood. That's not for us to determine if that cook was right. You know, what if the, what if the cook was smoking meth in the bathroom and that's yeah. why the lady fired her? Yeah. And then they like make up some story and. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, yeah. you know, you've, you, you're chefs. You've heard sob stories. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah yep oh, my, my dog God. and my cat and my grandmother died I can't yeah, my grandmother it, died three times this year <laughs> uh, uh okay but yeah the facebook Sorry. group but but in, in in the big scope of it i think it's awesome um like i'm trying to i met this one dude from africa his name's henry fundy okay. and uh he never, ever asked me for money. Me and him talked on Facebook for maybe two years. And one time I asked him if I could send him a, like a little bit of money. And I sent him $100. And that turns out to be like two, three weeks of income for him. He's living in Tanzania. Wow. And then um, about two years later, he hit me up and asked me if I could help him get into culinary school. Because he knew I was a chef. And I'm like, oh, man, Fundy, I don't know. Like, college is expensive. And he... He shot me the number over, and it was like, it was like two million of uh, I don't remember the currency of, of uh, Tanzania. Oh, a shilling. So it was like two two and a half million shillings. So I went and did the math. I went and googled it and figured out the exchange rate. And it was like two hundred and fifty dollars. Wow. So my wife's like, "Are you sure he's going to do it?" And I was like, "Well, it's two hundred fifty bucks." I hope he does. And we sent it to him and he's, he literally sent me pictures of him uh, in culinary school, his little outfit and stuff. Huh. You know, I want to, I want to try to turn that into helping people. Yeah. You know, that's pretty I'm funny. not talking about becoming a full on um, philanthropist. Yeah. That's not that. But if we can help people, you know, like think about that, like that might change that dude's life forever and it might change his children's life, you know? So I would like to do something like that. You know, it's just trying to help out a little bit. Yeah. Are um are all the admins and like the moderators, are they like friends of yours or people that just applied or how did that all work? So the administrators are all people that I know really close uh, cook friends. Uh, the okay, moderators. Cool. Yeah. 
Um, the, I had to make a bunch of people moderators because we got so busy. I couldn't keep up with it. We would oh, yeah, get for sure. Like we get like 600 requests a day. Um, Holy so yeah, Christ. and I always got to make sure that a moderator ain't going rogue. You know, I've had to delete two moderators, um, for people making jokes and them just, uh, just deleting them, you know, and like, I'm all about free speech. Just don't, don't be talking no racist shit, you know, like, don't be, yeah. I don't want to hear anything about like sexuality, like anyone's sexual preference, you know, like, don't be making fun of people for that. But I don't think everything else is open. I don't care. Yeah. So don't be, you know, you know what I mean? Like, don't go across yeah. the board. But it'd just be like little things, and he would just delete people for no reason. Oh wow! <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I, but yeah, it's, I post it's definitely and interact. I I post and interact with the page every every chance that I can and stuff. It's kind of it's funny. People, some guy uh, recently posted a picture of his chives. You know how chefs are with chives. Yeah, <laughs> and, it, and it and it looked like um, I I swear he was trolling everybody because it looked like fucking scallions. Hmm. But he cut them so thin, or I, I don't know. It, it just. I just seen one. I just seen one today. This dude was cutting up um, chives. It looked like, and they were in like one inch sections. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was thinking, you know, like he he got to be trolling us. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then there's like three hundred comments of like, "What the fuck is that?" <laughs> like. <Yeah. laughs> It's pretty. It's I I I enjoy it. I like it a and lot. The, so. the best is the flat tops. Like everybody and their mother <laughs> cleans their flat top, okay? And they'll like show it off like it's a new car. You like yeah, you just wax their Camaro. Yeah. So like yeah, r- roast this. <laughs> every, yeah. Every every day, somebody posts a picture of a. Hey, here's my before and after. What do you think? Yeah. You missed a spot, you dumbass. <laughs> like. <laughs> That's I, pretty fun. I don't even I don't even post pictures of, of my kitchen in that group because any little fucking thing. I mean, you could have a, the the most cleanest kitchen with the most beautiful dish, and them motherfuckers will find something wrong. Yeah, you could right? have They'll a take, brand yeah. spanking new kitchen. Everything. <laughs> And they're like, what the fuck? Those knobs on the fucking flat top. Oh, like, it's, <laughs> oh my god, it's it's pretty funny. It's good. It's good fun though. It's good oh humor. yeah, it's it's great humor. I'm so glad. <laughs> Speaking of flat tops, though, are you a lemon juice or a vinegar guy? I don't. Are you the, I had to probably lemon juice. Yeah, some ketchup or mustard. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm more of a uh, I'm more of a lemon juice kind of guy myself. Yeah, what I are you? Okay. Lemon juice. Yeah, so I'm bad for the same team. <laughs> Getting a war up. No. Something about lemon juice. Yeah. People right. like, uh, I had somebody tell somebody about, fuck, I I'm sort of drawing a blank, but they're like, don't, or maybe it was on the page. It's like, don't season the flat. Yeah, I think somebody made a post about don't season the flat top with, or clean the flat top with vinegar and or lemon juice because it's going to create the food to be. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like they, the, somebody is like, you know, it's like a, like somebody that doesn't know something like a guest yeah. and they ask for, <laughs> you know, something stupid. And then the person was like, somebody at my job told me that I couldn't season or clean the flat top with lemon juice or vinegar because they didn't want that to penetrate the food that you cook on the flat top. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? Yeah, and then the flat top, like, um, so first job I ever had, they threw ice on it to clean it, all right? And then I went to the next job, and I was getting ready to throw ice. They're like, no. They're like, that will crack the entire flat top. And uh, and then later on, I find out that it can mess with the seals of the flat top. Oh, but yeah. I've never, ever seen or heard of one cracking. And I always wondered, like, where did that person hear that from? Yeah. <laughs> We put, You're gonna uh, crack it. Yeah, we put ice on it all the time. Yeah, that's a put, then, which is no basically brick. no difference of putting water on it. Yeah, like we do ice, grill brick with a little bit of oil from the fryer, <laughs> um, and then scrape it, and then lemon juice or vinegar. Yeah, but we that, we have a stewarding team that does it. They they do a phenomenal job. It's crazy. Those guys yeah, more really fryer oil. I think everybody uses fryer oil. At least chefs do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Food cost. Yeah. It's cheap. It's right there. Yeah. Food cost. Yeah. Yeah. I love just. Do you I have love a fryer? Just dipping it. Yeah. Um, the, the type of fryer oil do you have? Is it like that? 
emulsified stuff that when it heats up, it like, or is it liquid? No, it's liquid. Like the, have you seen the white like fryer the, gel like crisp, stuff? Like kind of like it looks like almost Crisco ish. Yeah, yeah, that stuff. It just. Uh, I mean, right now yeah. I work at a place where we have two fryers of just straight beef fat. Oh, uh, dude. Oh my so god! Awesome. Is it? Oh, bro, listen, listen. I you always is it, so I'm a little bit older. As a kid, I swear to God, McDonald's fries were better. Oh yeah, right? oh yeah, because they, they fried and, it in beef tallow. Yes, and then I recently just found this out about two years ago. Because now, yeah, and nowadays we're using all this. Like I think we're using canola oil. Yeah, you know, like like uh, I tried to rent, run a a veal schnitzel out here because it's very traditional. Yeah, and um, nobody bought it, and or I think we sold like three of them that day, mm-hmm. and I had like four people complain. Jeez. <laughs> about the baby cow. I don't. I don't mean. I don't want to be kind of an asshole, but typical Americans' palates suck. Yeah, <laughs> that's how, all I got to say. I don't no, want to and into it, it. it really is, and because Americans like so, when you think normal like Americans, they think good eating is like Olive Garden, Texas Roadhouse, you know, Chilis. things like that. Applebee's, yeah. Taco Bell, Subway. <laughs> I, I, I wish Taco Bell would go away. I don't get it. Like, we have all these great Mexican places out here, and people still go to Taco Bell. Yeah. God, I, I can't ever go to Applebee's after my first job. <laughs> my first steakhouse, I was actually starting my mentor. Um, he had me start a garbage and I made the typical, like, bad decision of poking a hole in the plastic to grab a uh, lettuce out and yeah. start making salads. And he watched me do this for a few times, and he comes over, looks me dead in the eye, T- uh, rips open the drawer, takes the pan out, slams down on the counter, and goes, "This is at fucking Applebee's," <laughs> and I can't go to Applebee's after that. Yeah, I don't even know if I know how to operate a microwave anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, we so we had a tasting a couple days ago for a uh, pastry chef, and uh, they put some stuff in the microwave, and I was like, "Oh my god, you're using Chef Mike!" <laughs> they're, like, they're like, they're like, they're like Chef Mike. I'm like, yeah, Chef Microwave. And and I told her a story about when I worked at a, a diner and it was like everything was portioned, everything was, you know, and they used the microwave to, it was to like steam the half rack of ribs <laughs> in, a, in plastic wrap yep. in the microwave. That's and then Chef would, Mike's specialty. Yeah. And it was in the, and we, <laughs> on the line, it was called Chef Mike. And so we, so she, they were like, I've never heard that before. You, you always learn something new. It was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, first time I ever heard Chef Mike, I thought that was amazing. I think I was watching um, Kitchen Night- Nightmares, and the dude was like, "Yeah, Kitchen Chef Mike works a lot around here." <laughs> yep, Chef Mike. That's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Just giving you a dirty look. That's all. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Don't stare at me like that. Uh, no. Oh man, this has been fun. Uh, do you? Ha- I mean, do you have any questions for us? Or no, man. Uh, I had a great time. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I did too. Randy, you got any questions or? Um, my only thing was a uh, wife thing, but that was about it. You know? Yeah, 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 man. Uh, we should probably do this more often. Yeah, yeah. I I'll I'll come back and talk. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty That's good. It. I'm pretty good at it. Yeah, <laughs> no, you are, and and I like your uh, enthusiasm and values, and I, and just about the industry. Um, I guess before we go, do you have any last thing you want to share with the audience or with us? To, to seal it up so yeah if you want to uh if you want to get into the cooking industry you got to realize that it's very hard work okay but it is ultimately very very rewarding just like almost anything else in this life you get in what you put out all right and if you're in the industry already strive to be great don't ever put anything out my first chef had a thing he said imagine every plate you put out your signature is on that dish He's like, are you going to be happy for people to see that you sent that out? So just always strive to be better and learn, learn, learn. That's all I got. Awesome. Well, appreciate you, Chef. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, no problem. And for Thank the you, audience, chef. hope you enjoyed this episode. And uh, everybody, let's uh, have a wonderful night. Let's get back behind the burner. Yep. <laughs>